I saw soldiers everywhere. I saw military vehicles everywhere. And I saw the soldiers working, moving stuff around to make barricades and digging trenches, actively digging trenches. I want to talk more about Ukraine, 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 Ukraine. We should be talking about Ukraine. I wanted to show how uh, Perogozin, uh, I never know how to pronounce his name correctly, who is basically the head of the Wagner group at this point, uh, is talking about the failure to take Bakhmut. Why is this important? Well, because Wagner has been very heavily involved in the attack on Bakhmut. They've been sending thousands of their boys, many of them recruited from Russian prisons and being given lighter sentences if they join the Wagner group, whether it's for rape, murder, uh, any number of uh, mugging, theft, they're being given machine guns and told to run at the, the Ukrainian lines, seeing these people as more expendable because they're, they're from, you know, the, the lower ends of Russian society. They're in the prisons. And, and for these soldiers, while the odds of survival, and this guy's been very honest with them and saying, like, the odds of survival are low when talking to these soldiers, uh, to them, the conditions in these prisons are so horrific and so bad that they're willing to join uh, the Russian military and basically be used as cannon fodder. Um, anyway, the, the guy who's orchestrating all of this, the person who is the head of the Wagner group, uh, is no longer the founder. The founder of the Wagner group, who uh, was a neo-Nazi, uh, by the way, uh, people talk about Azo all the time, but a lot less people talk about that fact tied to the Wagner group. Um, this guy is talking about how it seems basically impossible that the Russians take Bakhmut. For those of you who don't know what ba Bakhmut is, I guess we can quickly go back to live map. Uh, Bakhmut is a location in the Donbass that is currently controlled by the Ukrainians that the Russians really want to capture. It's right here. It's in eastern Ukraine. And the Russians have been fighting very desperately to capture it because they need to capture this if they want to take the rest of the Donbass. They capture this, then maybe later they could try to... Uh, uh, capture Sovyetsk, and then later, you know, Kramatorsk, and then eventually, maybe, they can scrape away a victory in the Donbass. That seems to be the Russian plan at this point. They're very open about this, saying that they want to unite the Donbass. The Russians have, you know, put forward a lot of different goals in this war. The demilitarization, uh, demilitarization of Ukraine, that fail, failed. Uh, you know, the denazification of Ukraine, I, I think that's more of a buzzword, but I interpret that to be, which was, I think, the original goal, which was regime change in Ukraine, changing the government in Ukraine, that has failed. Uh, they have failed to stop the expansion of NATO, which was another goal of this uh, war, since, you know, Finland and Sweden, Finland having a very long border with Russia, is going to be joining NATO, so that has failed. Um, they, they failed on, on every level, but something that they've stuck to as, as the rest of those kind of like, you know, fall apart and they're not talking about those demands anymore is reuniting, uh, in their words, reuniting, but conquering the Donbass and taking it from Ukraine. But they've been unable to achieve this. But Bakhmut is a vital step in that. It's the one front where they're actively pushing and trying to capture um, on a consistent basis. And every day for the last month, I've had somebody come in here telling me Bakhmut's going to fall today. Bakhmut's falling soon. Back, oh, oh, you dumb Ukraine tard. Okay, Bakhmut's gonna fall, Bakhmut's gonna fall. And every time I tell them, wait and see, wait and see, the Ukrainians are fighting for it viciously, they're firing artillery, they, they've got the, uh, their soldiers uh, dug in in the city, and every day, the same result would be the Russians attack, they get mowed down, then they fall back. That was until the Ukrainians actually started pushing back in some areas south of Bakhmut. And now they, they're just unable to enter the city. And so... After uh, thousands upon thousands of Russians have been grinded down, and let me just be clear, a lot of Ukrainians have died in this battle too. A lot of blood has been shed on both sides. Uh, a, a key figure in this war, Perogazin, who who earlier during the uh, the uh, the attempts to capture Bakhmut was very prideful, very boastful. When Zelensky was visiting, he was like, why don't you come to me, Zelensky? We'll meet in person before I take this city. Uh, this guy is now trying to give as many excuses as possible as to why he cannot take it. <clears throat>
Russia's shadow army boss has tried to explain away his mercenaries group's failure. Let me zoom in a little bit more. It's easier to see. His mercenary group's failure to take the Ukrainian stronghold of Bakhmut by claiming Ukraine has 500 lines of defense there. Uh, he made the claim in an interview uh, with Russian state media published Tuesday, telling the news agency that the Wagner Group can't seem to break through Ukrainian defenses around the city. Ukraine's military has fended off a Russian takeover there for months during a brutal battle against the notorious mercenaries. In the face of relentless Russian attacks, the city has gained a huge symbolic significance. While pro-Kremlin pundits and Perogazin himself have for weeks taunted Ukrainians with the threats that Bakhmut will soon fall, the Wagner boss now appears to be acknowledging what Western experts and British intelligence have already predicted. Russia is unlikely to achieve any major wins in the area anytime soon. It's a fortress in every home, he said in a video published on the state media uh, website. The guys lock horns for every home sometimes not just for one day sometimes for a week over one home they take one home they take a second a third perogazin said but they still can't break through the defenses to say there are 500 lines of defense would probably not be a mistake every 10 meters there is a line of defense he said while meeting with his mercenaries now the thing is, um, we'll, we'll continue this interview, um, and we'll continue, we'll read the rest of the article. But I was in the Donbass. I went down there to uh, film a, a, a dog shelter. And while I was there, I got to see the defenses in a well-known city. The city of Kramatorsk, which the Russians have said they intend to capture. In fact, they would need to capture Kramatorsk if they were f to fulfill the promise of conquering the Donbass, of, you know, taking all this land. In fact, the battle to take Bakhmut is one of the lead ups to the Russian plan to take Kramatorsk. Uh, now, Bakhmut is a city of about 15 to 20,000. I think its pre-war population was 10,000. Now it's like very small, but we're talking about a range of 5,000 to 20,000 people. Kramatorsk, can we get a Kramatorsk? When I was there, uh, one second, there it is, is much bigger. A population of 2017 of 150,000. It's a much bigger city. That's a lot more dense. And I was there months ago. I don't know, like five or six months ago, I was in Kramatorsk. And then they were digging trenches. This is when Kramatorsk was surrounded on three sides and they were getting shelled constantly. They're still getting shelled, but the, they were shelling super hard. And when I was going through the streets, obviously I can't describe the defenses, but I saw them. I saw soldiers everywhere. I saw military vehicles everywhere. And I saw the soldiers working, moving stuff around to make barricades and digging trenches actively digging trenches and that was months ago and there was already defenses in the city from the last eight years of fighting because it's in the donbass and you know the donbass rebels want to take it meaning that we have eight years built up of defenses there we've got a ton of soldiers there and military equipment there trenches being dug and it's a city like six or seven times larger like, I think, well, if it's 20,000, it's one, two, three, sorry, I'm terrible with math, four, five, six, yeah, about six or seven times large, seven or eight times larger, actually, seven or eight times larger than Bakhmut. If the Russians are having this much trouble taking Bakhmut, how are the hell are they going to capture Kramatorsk? The whole point of capturing Bakhmut is so they can later capture Kramatorsk and then take all of the Donbass. So if they can't capture this and we have uh, high level Russian politicians and people in military positions like this guy, the, the, the head of the Wagner group, saying that this place is defended, like, you know, the, the defended crazily. Every 10 meters, there's another line of defense. Every house you have to fight room by room for weeks at a time after he was bragging about it beforehand. What does that say? It says they're fucked. It says that it sounds like in, unless conditions drastically change, 
that the Russians don't seem to be taking Bakhmut anytime soon. And if this is the reality, that explains Zelensky visiting Bakhmut a month ago before speaking to Congress a lot more to me. Maybe it's the Zelensky spirit that's 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 making them hold. Maybe it's the strategy. It's probably a, a, a bunch of factors. But now I it was still dangerous from the go there. But I don't think he was ever at risk of at least being overrun. <clears throat> Let's finish the article. One of the men under his command can be heard complaining in the footage that they don't have enough equipment or weapons to push further into Bakhmut. The Wagner boss's admission comes after Western intelligence noted that the manpower behind Russian attacks in the area has begun thinning out. The Brit and this is the thing, I said this earlier, the Russians are starting to stuff these units as they lose more and more of these guys, a lot of them being prisoners, just given the machine gun and thrown into battle. A lot of these people being uh, individuals who got drafted and have been given very little training, been given low quality equipment, not even medical gear, and just being thrown into the meat grinder, just hoping that the pressure of it will break the Ukrainian lines. This has failed. This is failing. And what they've done is doubled down on the strategy. And now they're taking artillery men, they're taking people who are specialized, the people who have uh, a lot of training to do these specific uh, tasks that are extremely helpful to the Russian war effort, and they're giving them a, uh, an AK and saying charge. And so the thinning out is starting to have an effect not only on infantry, but on other aspects of the the Russian military. Like, for example, when Marines had to be taken off of boats when the Russian Navy became useless in this war after the, uh, the sinking of the Moscow has to become, became more and more distant from uh, Ukrainian shores uh, due to, you know, the fact that Ukraine kept using these suicide boats and these, and these missiles to damage them. This is something that, if Russia continues to do, it's going to whittle down the effectiveness of their military across the board. One of the worst things Germany and Japan did, I think Germany might have done it earlier, was taking the people who trained their military, their officers who trained them, and making units of them and sending them to the front. Yes, they might be okay at fighting. Yes, they might know what they're doing, and that's good. But once you lose those guys, now you've lost your trainers, and now you're going to have shittier trainers pumping out even shittier troops, leading to then even higher casualties. And there's been rumors of that happening. If that starts to happen, uh, that's a no-return situation, because the Germans started doing that in 43 and 44. The Japanese started to do that towards the end as well. It's never a good sign when you have to start to do that. <clears throat> the Wagner uh, thinning out. The British Ministry of Defense noted in its latest assessment on Tuesday that while Russia has increased the frequency of attacks around Bakhmut, many of these operations were poorly supported. A Ukrainian soldier near Bakhmut also says it seems the Russian side is running out of prison inmates to send to the front line. In an interview with Radio New Times, uh, Yegenvi Oprani, I'm sorry, I'm very bad with pronunciations, said Russian troops seem to be out of breath after unsuccessfully attempting to storm Ukrainian positions around the New Year holiday, leaving Wagner with heavy losses. But we're also learning from their, uh, but they're also learning from their own mistakes and not mindlessly carrying out so many offensives anymore. He said, both sides have suffered staggering losses in and around the city, leading to even some pro Kremlin figures to question whether the Russians' offensive there was worth the senseless meat grinder it had created for them. But the city appeared to take a heightened, uh, heightened significance for Moscow after a series of crushing losses everywhere saw Russians retreat from territory Putin has proudly declared to be part of Russia. Bakhmut, seen in some ways as Russia's last stand after Ukraine took back Kharkiv and Kherson, was also part of the Donbass region Putin had dubbed a priority after the Kremlin's failure to take Kiev. That's what I'm talking about. This has always been the thing that they've pointed out and said, at the very least, we're going to take this to justify all of this sense slaughter and they're unable to achieve that now i don't know if i would call this russia's last stand because I, I, like they're they're gonna fight even if they lose this battle but there is something to be said that this is like the only offensive russia's really carrying out uh, with a strong effort right now and they're failing and this is on the back of like the article said of their loss in lyman 
the horrific for them at least great for us counteroffensive around Kharkiv that l led to the fall of Kopyansk which was a strategic hub for them and the loss of the only provincial capital the Russians captured for the entire war in Kherson leading to over 50% of the territory that they've captured since the start of the February invasion turning over back into Ukrainian hands Ukraine has recaptured over 50% of that territory and so if they were to then lose another battle even if they're the ones attacking that would do nothing but put more egg on the face of not only the wagner group which people are going to start questioning uh but also of of shoigu the russian defense minister uh the generals in charge of of giving this these orders the the people who of course sold out the 1.5 million winter uniforms out of the back of trucks because they're corrupt and it's going to eventually after enough losses there's going to be questions directed at putin even if it takes a while and he'll be the last domino to start getting pushed like eventually after enough losses there has to be some questions asked right like after Idi Amin took enough losses people started to ask questions um after uh, saddam uh, had enough losses people asked questions even if it didn't lead lead to his removal it, it can certainly weaken his grip on power even if putin isn't necessarily removed by his own people. Progazin, who had for months boasted about this, uh, about his guys being more ruthless and able to do what ordinary Russian troops could not, could not released a series of attention-seeking propaganda videos said to be from Bakhmut in late December, in which he ordered his mercenaries to fire off weapons and taunted the Ukrainian President Zelensky with an invitation to meet on the front line. Maybe by the evening we'll be able to meet, he said. I'm sitting, waiting for you near Bakhmut. Days later, however, Russian airborne troops were sent to the area to prop up Wagner operations, a move widely seen as evidence that they were not going, things were not going according to plan for Russia's tough-talking shadow army boss. Great article by the Daily Beast. Uh, I say this all the time. Listen to Russian state media. Listen to Russians uh, working in the government, what they say to their own people. Don't listen to them as in, oh, wow, this is a great opinion. This person said a great thing. Or, oh, this person's speaking the truth. Listen to it to see the cracks and to see just how insane, how insane their commentary is. But in this instance, we're seeing some cracks.